And um, welcome to this uh, very special transmission um, that's, that's coming to you on behalf of the wonderful uh, Dublin Book Festival. And it is celebrating the launch of this extremely, if I say so myself, this extremely attractive publication, Winter Papers, number six. We're all growing old and even more beautiful together uh, with, with every passing moon and every <laughs> passing and every passing season. Um, we, we, we all know it's an, an utter kind of bollocks of now year, really. We'd usually be in Smock Alley uh, for the book festival or somewhere, and we'd all be going off to the pub and to discos and all that kind of thing afterwards and have it, have it, have it a bit of a party. Um, this year, we're, we're, we're obviously all at home and, 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 and we're, we're doing what we can with Dowl Internet and Dowl Zoom and all that kind of thing. Um, I'm delighted to have uh, a glamorous and international cast of contributors with us here uh, this evening. Uh, three of our, uh, we have, as ever, 20 odd contributors to the book. Three of them are with us. Um, I'm going to say hello. I'm actually going to ask you in, in the now traditional way with the old Zoom calls to, 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 to tell us what's outside your nearest window. Um, I'll come first to Miss Roisin Kybert, who is in the beautiful city of Berlin. Where, where are you, Roisin, exactly? Hello, um, and thank you for having me on this. Um, I'm, in, I'm in Berlin right now, in Kreuzberg. If I look uh -huh. outside my window, there's a, a flat full of ridiculously attractive French people who have a much more active lockdown social life than me. I hate um, that. Yeah. yeah, they sing at night, they drink in that dignified French way, they drink wine yeah. on the balcony, I stare at them, it's kind of a touch of the Jimmy Stewart, I'm watching them, I don't yeah. know if they're watching me. And beyond that, the wilds of Kreuzberg, graffiti, people... You see, the, the, the French can go drinking, the French can go drinking very civilised and just have one or two. They don't have the Irish thing of the lip. Oh, Jesus, I have a lip on me now, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and then it's that, 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 too late. It's too late, yeah. but yeah. So you're in Kreuzberg. So, so Pfizer um, is, is, start, is, that, is Pfizer in Berlin? Is that, is yeah, that it's um, German, I think. Yeah, I'm holding, Fantastic. I hope, because I have to go back to Ireland for three days in the next few weeks, and I'm going to have to do a 10-day quarantine. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Have, you, have you been most of the lockdown in Berlin, Roisin? Yeah, yeah, I have. Um, I had one trip back and it. Uh, what followed was I had to visit a military tent and get the swab from a, a wow. young German guy in camo. Um, wow. Yeah, it felt, it was strange. It was very children of men. Um, that was before the quarantine measures were introduced. We're in partial lockdown now. Yeah, it's a lockdown light or something they're calling it. it, it, it it's, it's incredible just still how, how, how quickly we all turned into this bad kind of dystopian TV movie, isn't it? Like with, yeah. with kind of sort of, you know, a, a low budget kind of a dystopian <laughs> movie that we're in. Um, Mr. Tim McGowan, can you can you give us a precise, a precise uh, description <laughs> of your whereabouts, Tim? Thank you. Uh, yeah, the, the Mexico, thanks for having me first. This is great, yeah, uh, yeah. I'm very excited. Uh, yeah, I'm in the sort of the Mexico City equivalent of Kreuzberg. Uh, similar amounts of okay. cool graffiti and things like that. But the, the view through the window is a, a, a carpenter uh, who I sort of shoot dirty looks the back of his head when he's hammering too much. Uh, and then uh, like just generic yard, weeds, right. gravel, my yeah. favorite. The, the, car the carpenter immediately sounds sinister in some way as if there's a, a situation uh, developing. He's a grand lad. Like he's similar to the French lads on the on the on the balcony that Roisin's looking at. In the sense yeah. that his pals come around. Sophisticated on a Frenchies. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. We're passing a, a two a one and a half liter bottle of Corona around between the three of them on a Friday evening, while I just sort of glower and yeah. envy them. You know, Irishly in, in, in the back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The fellas, you know, what's good <laughs> with the fellas? But I can't do with the fellas. And 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 our, our next member we have Karini Dockertig. Kerry, tell us where you are. I am in the very middle of Ireland. I'm in County Westmeath. 
at the end of a very lonely laneway. <laughs> And it's 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 an old railway cottage, is it? It is, yeah. It's an old stone railway okay. cottage. Right. Yeah. Um, I, I, just, I, yeah. I feel a novel coming on, Kerry. Do you write fiction yes. as well? I do. I think I might be swerving a bit more towards fiction now after yeah. the year that's been in it. Like, in fairness, I, I, I could I, I could see it. I could see it coming. I, yeah. I I could see a railway cottage featuring very strongly. Yeah. Literally. Yeah. I, exactly. I I I I should say that I'm in South County Sligo, so I'm not too far from you. So you're over yeah. kind of you're in that direction. Yeah, is kind of there in Berlin, and Tim is off off out, off out far in, <laughs> yeah. in, in the other direction. Um, so yeah. listen, thanks to thanks for showing up, everyone, and thanks to the book festival for having us. Uh, we'll we'll go on to the little the little mini readings we're going to do. I, I'll come to you first, Roisin. I should, in my professional way, do a proper introduction. And Roisin Kybert has been published in the Dublin Review, The Stinging Fly, The White Review, The Guardian, many others. She wrote a column on internet subcultures for advice and her book, The Disconnect, is coming from Serpent's Tale next year and is very eagerly um, anticipated uh, around this parish for sure. Um, Roisin, would you, would you set up your piece for us and give us a little blast of it? Yes, um, so I'll introduce it. Yeah. It's um, called Life Force Frequencies and I wrote it kind of in the first half of lockdown when uh, running almost like a sort of subtext to a lot of other more urgent news stories, there were these stories appearing in the news about 5G mast burnings. Um, <laughs> and uh, it also, it kind of goes all over the place. It talks about like Russian spies and internet cables and uh, uh, electrosensitive people who can feel the internet um, and the fact that I can hear rat alarms uh, and electricity yeah. sometimes, which I think means I have very immature ears. I, I was going to come to the rat alarms <laughs> rather than later. Yeah, yeah um, but you know, overarchingly, it's about the internet as a physical reality and what we don't think about every day when we use it. Cool. Give, give, give us another blast. Yeah, so I'll read the very beginning of it. Life force frequencies. <laughs> There's a video I come back to sometimes on YouTube. It captures a shark trying to chew through the internet backbone, a cable which transmits information around the world. The shark appears through fogged turquoise water and hovers a moment before it bites. It persists, but the cable won't break. Finally, the shark turns away I detect in its wide eyes and rictus jaw a certain exasperation. Then it swims off, fading into the blue distance. Stories about sharks eating the internet were popular online a few years ago. The video became something of a meme, enough that the International Cable Protection Committee published a report titled, Sharks are not the nemesis of the internet. The report lists no shark-induced damage since 2007, but does detail the first recorded incident of this sort in 1985, when a fiber optic cable was damaged near the Canary Islands. The culprit was a deep-dwelling crocodile shark, Pseudocarcharias camoharii, it reads, explaining that the attack led to design improvements of the cable's protective sheathing that effectively eliminated the problem. To me, the story was not so much that a fanged sea creature would conspire to chew the cable, but that the cable was in the sea in the first place. I'm not used to thinking of the internet as a physical reality. I'm used to it floating through the air. I'm used to envisioning the internet as a cloud, as an ethereal fifth element, or talking about it in a vaguely metaphorical way, as something that drapes over me like a veil of frenetic meta-reality. The sense of the internet as magic was challenged earlier this year when my boyfriend and I moved into a flat in the South Dublin suburb of Black Rock. We were renting at a steep discount from relatives while they hunted for a permanent tenant. The flat was ideal. It was big with great transport links and a beach only a few minutes away, but it was also an internet black spot. There was no Wi-Fi, and we couldn't use our phones as hotspots. As soon as we were through the door, all coverage disappeared. During our time in that flat, I felt the internet reconfigure time and space around us. In the mornings, we sat by the window, waiting for connectivity bars to appear on our screens. We hovered in the doorway on cold February nights, holding our phones up as though in prayer or as ritual, begging the gods for data. Digital detoxes have become popular in recent years, but I suspect their effect is only relaxing when it's desired and anticipated. Time passed slowly, nervously inside the flat. 
without music or videos or ready access to information, we were forced to sit alone with ourselves and with each other. Beautiful. I, 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 was, I was very struck, um, Roisin, reading the piece um, by, by a memory of, of just a, a few months ago, when just before coronavirus started, we were in, we were in South America, Olivia and I, my, uh, the co-editor, Olivia Smith and I, um, and we were out in a place on the coast for a few days that had no, no internet. And Jesus, we were fierce edgy like. And I'm like, I, I, I'm, I'm someone who, I'm someone who <laughs> pretends not to be online very much, but I'm, you know, I'm, 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 I'm online as much as everyone else. And it was amazing, almost the physical um, sensation of not being online, constantly kind of feeling a, a slightly at odds with ourselves. And, yeah. uh, and, and the other thing that was very striking to me in, 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 in your piece was like, you, you quoted it there, this, the sense of this thing actually has a physical reality, which we're, we're, we're just, not even vaguely aware of it's something that gets kind of maintained by lads in high-vis jackets and lane <laughs> cables and, and, and all this kind of stuff yeah um, completely the one that really stuck with me was when i found out that 90 percent of the cables are still they're just left in the sea because uh, aside from the internet i think another thing that i'm genuinely fascinated by enough that i'd like to write more about is creatures at the bottom of the sea, like octopuses and things, you know, and that uh, my interest in them comes from their complete lack of interaction with us. They're just like this other world, but the internet is down there. Like, I mean, it's on, it's on a plateau, but it's the same route that the original telegraph cable followed. Um, and there's like a hundred years worth of just technology just littered down at the bottom of the sea and it doesn't get pulled up again. Yeah. T t tell us a little bit about the book that's coming, Roisin, The Disconnect. It's, it's, it's again, it's, it, it's on tech issues and on yeah, the online it, world. And it's a hybrid. It, it's a, a kind of memoir slash cultural criticism. Um, and it, it, again, sort of goes into all these different areas and unites them through my own story of the last, uh, maybe the last like decade almost of my life or less. But um, yeah, it, it's just about taking stock of the, t the dystopia in front of us. And yeah. Things have become a lot more dystopian since I wrote it, but <laughs> yeah. um, in ways which have only confirmed what I suspected. So hopefully, you know, yeah. it's a there, relevant there, book. <laughs> there, 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 there's increasingly, there's, there's so much kind of um, nostalgia for the analog world around now as well, isn't there? Like I, I've noticed in the mm. last year, or so in the US especially, you see all these kind of digital detox kind of holidays offered and, yeah. and, and like everyone is buying the vinyl records and all that as well, just trying to get back to things that have, have, have to be plugged in, in, yeah. in kind of, and wound up and, uh, and so forth. I mean, do you think this is kind of a natural kind of um, just, just, just reaction against the fact that we're all online all the time or, or is, it, is it kind of useful that, that people are kind of trying to step back maybe just a little bit? I don't know, I find that really interesting. For something else I wrote recently, I ended up reading about Nietzsche buying a typewriter. Um, and if you look up a picture, it was when his sight started to fail. And it's this golden ball with these like buttons all over it. And as he started to use it, he says it changed, he said it, it changed his writing. Hmm. Um, so, I mean, writing on paper for me, I always have to do that at one point, at one stage, and then I switch over to the screen. And I think both bring out different tendencies and different qualities. Um, but as to the sort of nostalgia for the analog, like I have a lot of respect for people who, you know, come out and say, delete your account and there's an yeah. off button. If you remember to press it, yeah. you know, I, I, I get it, but I'm coming from a perspective where I've been on the internet more of my life than I've not. Sure. And yeah. I wouldn't have work and I wouldn't have probably a social life without it. And I despise right. it a lot of the time. And I'm very aware of its political subtext. It's kind of, you know, surveillance capitalism and everything that's bound up in these services. But I also I'm not going to tell readers to delete their accounts. I'm yeah. coming from the perspective that we're cyborgs, that it's already part of us. Yeah, and, 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 and we all benefit from it. You know, people talk about our books online and people talk about our articles and, and disseminate them in these ways. But it's, um, it, it's interesting. It, it definitely changes you uh, as a writer in, in, in the way that you form sentences. And, and I find when I go and do the, the, the longhand, um, the sentences start getting very kind of curlicued and ornate and gone on for fucking ever. Like, you know, like <laughs> claws after claws yourself. after claws. It's like Dickens is back, you know. <laughs> like I, I get the bit of my hand, but it's, um, I, 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 I definitely think in terms of like writing fiction, it seems to me that you, you, the reader is a more impatient species now that, than the reader used to be even 10, 20 years ago. You kind of have to get them quicker. 
um, mm. on the page. But it's 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 uh, when, when exactly is the book coming, Roisin? When it when is it? It's currently set for March fourth next oh, so, year. So it's um, all done. It's all done. Yeah, um, yeah. I only that. got to see the cover of it today. Actually, um, it's Technicolor. Um, it's got a melting head and vaporwave color scheme. Uh, it's wild. I'm so happy with it. Fantastic serpent's tail, isn't it? Brilliant. Yeah, that's it. Mindless plug. <laughs> <laughs> um, we're, we're, we're going to, to hop along to, to, to Mexico City, to, to, to Mr. Tim McGowan. Um, Tim, Tim, always when we ask people to, to contribute uh, to winter papers, we kind of say like an essay or a story or, or whatever, a hybrid. Um, and when I, yours came in, I was reading it with, with, with massive glee and enjoyment, a, a fabulous piece. I, I, I was kind of, because it's a kind of a journalist figure, um, in Mexico City, I was thinking, oh, great, he, he, he's turned in an essay. Uh, fantastic. And then after a while, kind of Rory Gallagher uh, showed up. And I thought, is, is this a story or is it an essay? And all the way through, what, one of the things I loved about it was I, was, I wasn't quite sure uh, where we were. Like, it, it's, it's, it's a narrative. Um, yes. uh, but but, but I, I was never quite sure. I was always a bit uncertain with the eye, which is one of the things I really liked about it. Um, oh geez, thank you. I forgot to get. I'm very unprofessional. I have to give the no. proper winter papers introduction to uh, Tim McGowan, who's the author of "Call Him Mine" and "How to Be Nowhere." Marvelous. Um, I guess crime fiction books with I would say serious literary intent and literary style. On <laughs> it comes <laughs> off. Yeah, I hope so. <laughs> I'm pretty sure it does. Um, Tim's fiction and nonfiction and poetry. Poetry as well has appeared in Gore, Stinging Fly, the Dublin Review, and so forth. Uh, give, give us an old blast. Give us an old blast, Tim, of, of, of your piece. I will, of course, yeah. It's called Paisano. Um, that's, I've butchered the Spanish word, very embarrassed now, but uh, it's got an epigraph uh, from Victor Serge's uh, Memoirs of a Revolutionary. And he says, um, the dead are very close to the living, and I do not see them as separated by some frontier. Things remained strange for me well into my first year of drugs and alcohol. I blame Mexico City. Huge and claustrophobic at the same time. The din, the cram, the heat, the brownish perma shimmer of smog. All of these lend ordinary walks, the lysergic urgency of a panic dream. Apart from going to NA meetings, I did most of my socialising on Sunday afternoons when the volume on everything goes down about half a notch. One such Sunday, I was in the Centro, on a street whose name I can't remember. One of those gloomy rows of Tesantle stone apartments, their eaves like frowns, their stonework dried blood red, quarried from the wreckage of Tenochtitlan's old temples and palaces, which were in turn made from stone, hacked out of the long, dark tongues of magma that swiped in over Quiquilco in the 4th century AD, swallowing it forever, making the present city a matryoshka of wreckage, one ruin hidden inside the other, all the way to the core. The air was cool on my skin. There weren't any vendors yawping about the place. The thud of electrocumbias was at least three streets away. Trees swayed above a small park where a man lay on a bench, his beard like an old brillo pad, his face ruddy with street tan, his eyes the yellow of old cue balls as he watched a kid kick flies away from the eaten patches of pink and a mangy dog's arse. I pressed the buzzer, which was set in a scrolled brass plaque inlaid with fiashis, the old porfiriato era eagle rearing above the letters SPQN, a serpent flailing in its beak. I was there to meet a photographer I'd met on assignment in Oaxaca covering a left-wing indigenous uprising that hadn't, in fact, wound up crushed by the police. This was a rare glimmer of hope during a presidential term when 43 students had been disappeared, when protesting teachers could expect to be shot in the head, and when two of my friends, driven mad by the atmosphere of repression and despair, had vanished. One a probable suicide, the other a foot soldier in a Marxist group in Chiapas. That's three minutes, I think. Fair play to you, Tim. <laughs> um, what, what, one of the first things that, that came to mind, Tim, when I was reading was the possibility of this becoming a longer piece at some point it, 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 it seems like one that one that could have legs is that something that you've considered or yeah it, it's funny when I, when I wrote it uh, this is all that remains of a full novel about Rory Gallagher that I, I just sort of uh, I whittled away at it until mm. it was a, was that a, a longish 
poem. Yeah, it's not a lot. Like. A longish poem, 17 part, uh, that's sort of doing the submissions tango at the moment. And, uh, and this, but there's about 250 pages of notes from it as well. And um, I, I like the speaker. It's the same, it's the same speaker as the, as the novels I've written. Um, because uh, I sort of think of all, all, you know, it's like, it's all utterance, like, you know what I mean? It's mm. not, uh, I often find that like, um, un, was it sort of unsuccessful speech or, or um, speech that doesn't find an address or a location in someone else's register or listening or whatever, it, it, it builds up in my head like a horrible sort of an ocean or whatever. And um, I find form to be a great la- life raft and all that and syntax, grammar even, just to, get some sort of struts together so that the consciousness can kind of be in that roaring space. So yeah, like it could definitely go on and on. And I have a few short stories with this speaker. The poems are mostly in his voice as well. And um, I, yeah, I take that idea of a, a poem has a speaker, so does a fiction, yeah. a piece of fiction. So does an <laughs> it's all a position somewhere. And yeah. uh, the identity between the two is, is very blurry, of course, but yeah. quite a lot of stuff happens to me and it, it doesn't feel real and, and a lot of stuff that hasn't happened also feels quite real to me. So yeah, I, I definitely live in a very weird zone there, all right. But the the, the, <laughs> the, the, the great um the great advantage you have with the material, Tim, is, is is you're embedded, you know, that you're in you're in Mexico City and then and and the the, the texture and the detail of the place is, is beautifully got all the time and 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 it really really comes across as so how long have you been there now? How long have you been uh, in Mexico? On and off for about seven years. Uh, okay. it, it was a childhood dream to be here, you know, like mm. um, for a really, really long time. And so, like, I feel really like um, I feel like it was a sort of a psychological place before I arrived. Mm. And now that I'm here, mm. the, the, it resembles the memories and the impressions generated so closely that, like, it's it's very hard to avoid uh, mm. a certain amount of solipsism so in so social it, life. Yeah. It, it's always been a kind of a dream place. For you in some way. Yes, mm. yes, and to go to a place like there is that old line, like a, a place has to be a dream become, before it becomes real. But like, and you go there, and it, 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 it's still a place that's autonomous and, and has a life. But I, I've, I've still got that thread of, of my own, mm. really sort of, I don't know, they're almost metaphysical concerns, really, mm. uh, moving with me, and, and they, they find very ready metaphors and even characters, uh, yeah. pretty readily because you kind of you attract what you're worried about, you know. Yeah, and you're 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 kind of living and working in in, in Spanish, uh, I guess a, a a lot of the time now. Is is it is it changing your prose? Is it inflecting your 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 prose style in English to any degree? Do you think? Can you see that? I'd love through? that. I'd love it if it was. Yeah, I'd love that if it if it did. I was a big French uh, reader of French in university and stuff, and mm. my favorites were people like Montaigne and, and and Proust, of course. So I always had that like yen for the long sentence, the way syntax can trick you into saying mm. more than you want to. It's like a wire driven down into mm. the cracked surface, and the seepage is 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 is, is utterance, you know. Mm. And and then, you know, in terms of Spanish language writers, you do that. There's a guy called Balam Rodrigo who uh, he he he's he's a he's a pal, and I'm a huge fan of his work. Uh, mm. Trying to help his friend and translator find a home for it for the translation of his um. It's called the Central American Book of the Dead in English, wow. and it combines a bit of the old uh, psychogeography of the the, uh, the, 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 the south, southern part of Mexico where it sort of blurs into Guatemala um, combines that with a sort of almost a crime fiction register for the violence uh, that mm. happens to migrants and um, then they sort of the, the Baroque utterances of politicians which resemble almost to a T the formations of like golden age 17th century playwrights mm. so th- like yeah like the attention I pay to Spanish as a political thing and as a, you know, register of having a political import. Yeah. Um, that, that, that definitely gets my radar up for operating in English a bit. Um, mm. But like, I have no idea what I'm doing from one. I, 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 always, I, I always love the kind of heat that's generated as well when, when genre fiction and, and kind of fiction with literary intent kind of collide off each other and, and sparks oh, and give off. Was 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 crime fiction always a thing for you as well as a as a reader? Were you like a James a James Elroy boy fan as some of us have had the misfortune of being and all that kind of? God, yeah, he like when I first arrived here, the two lads I was reading most of were him and Bolaño because yeah. Bolaño used to joke that Elroy is, is the greatest living U.S. novelist. Mm. Uh, 
because he was like, you, you can't picture, you can't get a better photograph of the American soul than his character. Yeah. And yeah, the rhythms of his prose are just tremendous. <clears throat> Bolaño robbed a lot of those rhythms into Spanish For sure. too. So, but yeah, Elroy's big one. I like, um, I like, uh, I like Dorothy Hughes as well. The, the, uh, she, she wrote um, Pink Horse and she wrote uh, In a Lonely Place mm. as well. What she does with the first person in crime fiction is um, is a bit like a sort of a modernism turned inside out, right. a little bit. I've I've always felt that Highsmith, for example, uh, is, mm. is 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 a bit like um, you know, inverted Chekhov, say. Sure. And and yeah. and, and the moments I love most in Joyce, for example, um, definitely the ones where the later chapters in in the Nostos section, of Ulysses. Where it feels very noirish, like you know, it feels like mm. you're looking at a Jack Tardy comic. Sure. Yeah. And so, yeah, yeah, massive. And, I, and I've always felt there's a deep, there's a deep crossover, and it's not because of any kind of squeamishness about genre. It, it's just, it's just the concerns are basically identical, and the methods are um, poles apart. Yeah. Uh, but but they arrive at a really rich territory in the middle, you know. Fantastic. Okay, we, we, we'll come back to you, Mr. McGowan. Um, we're, we're moving along the, 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 the Zoom boxes and I'm going to Kerry <laughs> Nidocritic in County Westmeath. Kerry, I'll give you your... Kerry Nidocritic lives in an old stone railway cottage in the middle of Ireland. She writes about nature, literature and place. Now, you're, 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 you're very imminent. Your, 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 your debut uh, book, Thin Places, is it January, Kerry, it's coming? It is, yeah, January. Um, from, from, from January, the, the, yeah, 20th of January. From, from from the amazing uh, people at Canongate, they know what yeah. they're doing. Yeah, they, they do. Know what they're doing. <laughs> I tell you, um, that, that, there's already a huge swell of expectation about this book, Kerry. Um, <laughs> it, 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 it's got. It's, it's, I, 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 I have a strong suspicion it's going to fly uh, for you. Um, but to come to your piece, your your, your piece in Winter Papers. Um, it's a, it's kind of like I guess a diary, a diary piece in some ways of of, of your year in County Westmeath, and this is your yeah. first year there, is it? Yeah, we moved just before the pandemic. We moved in um, on Christmas Eve Eve. Oh. Yeah, so it's a bit of a weird piece. It's like quite fragmented. It is quite diary like, but I kind of have pushed a wee bit with the boundaries. It's been a bit blurry. Mm. Um, but sure, like that's any true story is never fully true, etc. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Give 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 us an old blast. Give us an old blast. For right. So thanks a million for having me. Maybe it all really started with the nests. When I began to brood, not over a clutch, but over time. When I stepped in a way, outside and inside, above and below the flow of it all the flow of my own blood, enough to really let those objects come. At the bottom of this laneway, objects came from everywhere, ordinary and flawed. On days when time and place no longer knew the way, and I took them. I took every single thing into my arms and hands and home. I was compliant. I knew at every turn I could not go back to how I lived before the objects came, to how I'd breathed and ached and mourned. They were an invitation I could do nothing but accept. Creamy white dove eggs, opened but unbroken, the skull of a badger, too sculpted to even seem real. On Mother's Day, my heart cracked open like a dry seed head, a perfect otherworldly antler from the field's exact middle. I took, I took, I took. Bone after bone, porcelain white and willowy, sheep and deer, horse and fox, the pelvic girdle of a delicately bird-like rat, objects so creaturely as to make the longing I had dragged here slowly, quietly, I struggled at first to talk of them. Their hold felt hex-like, fiercely personal. I only now see how terrified I was it all might stop. My lover continued through that unfamiliar spring, as always he had before, as though he had been made for it all, as though something inside of him had kicked into action, spluttering like the tractors the boys here use but once a year. 
It was as though this part had started up in him, no matter how surreal, without the need for oiling. The turf still being cut out from the earth, he seemed to say there are decent local lads texting decent local girls as they drive. And though he seemed to say, we don't approve, though we want to shoo them all away like butchering cats, it means the world, it still is turning, look at. It means the world still holds a hope for what yet might come. I think that's probably around three minutes. Or just, <laughs> that's really nice, Kerry. Um, like, I, I, I guess, uh, I, I, I live in a place that uh, in some ways would have lots, lots, lots in common. Um, yeah. with, with your neck of the woods, inland, kind of North Midlands, more than West of Ireland, really. And it's, totally. it's, it's, it's amazing. At first glance, these can look like very quiet places, but not very much going on I know um, right <laughs> but you, what you do in this piece and in, in all your writing you turn such a forensic eye on them and and you spring this kind of um this kind of intricate magic from them I think um oh, and, and that's and, lovely so so uh, I mean your your own background are you, are you from Derry City originally yeah I'm from from the city yeah um and lived there for a long time then kind of moved around a lot and then yeah. um and then finally ended up here in the middle, just bef really just before the pandemic. And then mm. we're like stuck here, <laughs> right yeah. in the middle. <laughs> but, it, but it's like, it's, it's, it's an interesting thing, isn't it? Where, where, where do writers yeah. go to live now, you know? Um, totally. You know, I mean, I th like 20 years ago, we'd probably all have been off living in, in uh, New York or London or something. That's where the writers exactly. used to go. Now it's like, yeah. where, where, where can I afford? <laughs> totally, you know? where can I afford to live if there's no work coming in? Like. <laughs> Yeah, but it's 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 weird. It, <laughs> Potentially, but that seems to be like a pragmatic decision in your life. But of course, it turns out to be one of the central creative decisions you make as well, because it, it's going to color uh, and in, in to play totally on a daily yeah. basis. Um, I I I I know I'm, I'm fiercely grateful for it. Like, yeah, I I I'm a I'm a bit of a one for bones as well when I find them around the place as as you do. Um, so like, I don't know, there's my, I don't know if you can see it or not, but there's my badger head from the wow. piece, my badger skull. Um, I oh. kept a few of them around just to show you. And this delicately uh, bird-like girdle, I'm not sure, can you see this? This is off the rat. This is off the rat, like my beautiful, boyfriend beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, carried it in for me and cleaned it up and sort of offered it to me. That's, um, that's, that's love. That's, yeah, that's true it's love. beautiful, <laughs> right? I know, like the I girdle have a, of a rat. <laughs> totally. And I, I have like I have the things that happen in the story, like they really did happen. So the bird mm. from the story really did come in and the objects yeah. really did come along. Um, and then, like, madly, I was kind of telling uh, people a few, like, kind of saying a bit by bit, oh, yeah, like, this keeps happening, you know, um, thinking, God, this is really weird. People are going to think I'm crazy. But sure, like, it happens to us all. We all yeah. find bones and it's, uh, yeah. yeah. And we, 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 we have times. to kind of... We, we have to kind of make little rituals, don't we? To, to, to keep it. Okay. Like, I, what I find with living in, 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 in rural Ireland is that there are there are times of the year when it doesn't seem to be offering you very much in terms of vitality, yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Like January, February, March, that long kind of brown brown season, I always call Completely it. Completely you know, turf time. Yeah, yeah, everything is kind of dormant and seems to be sleeping, yeah. but it's, you just have to kind of poke at it a bit. Don't you do, and, they, like the, and like, that's the thing. And the thing is like literally, so the things that I found, a lot of them were literally in the muck you know they were there in the earth which felt like it, it kind of grounded me in the way of there was me complaining like oh sure look we're stuck here and it's terrible and this is our two kilometers and whatever but the reality is sometimes you sometimes you can't see what you really like the really good the goodness of where you are so I think that's I think a lot of us have experienced that it sounds yeah. really cheesy but the pandemic has kind of yeah shifted our like our maps a bit yeah and uh, maybe maybe kind of um improved our quality of attention in some ways to, to uh, benefits around yeah. us Definitely. Um, I, I i think that's very evident in your work the quality of attention in it can, can you tell us a little bit about thin places uh, yes. about what you can expect from that absolutely so thin places is like very hybrid i would say um it's predominantly memoir with um sort of 
I look, so I look at my life growing up and there's a lot of trauma in it, but mm. there's a lot of light. So I find like when I've been in places, I was really interested in what Tim was saying about moving to Mexico because, you know, places, they do hold something, I think. Um, they can draw us in close and I think place and nature have been used a lot recently. Um, there's been a lot of discussion around them as being like places that people go to heal or whatever. But I kind of look in my book at what gets left over in place. So obviously I'm from Derry and mm. So like even just thinking about the river, what the river foil has witnessed in its in its lifetime and how that might affect like us who come from there and also maybe people when they think of the place. So thin places is about that idea of thin places, places where the veil is a bit thin and you can feel like you're not really here or there. It's it's when I try to describe it, it sounds really airy fairy, and it's really not an airy fairy book, like at yeah. all. <laughs> but, yeah. No. So I, my my mother's side of my family came from West Limerick, from the county. Uh, my father's my father's crowd were from the city, uh, but but they used to, they were kind of witches essentially. They were on a place called Knockfearna Hill, and it was always said uh, about Knockfearna Hill that the ground was very thin. Like, uh, that very there was thin. a very thin layer between Knockfearna Hill yeah. and the, the underworld, you know, just just underneath. Totally. Um, yeah. I, I, I'm going to go back along the line of boxes um, because we have we have such a we have such we have such a, a selection of delights. In the, by the way, this lady, this beautiful lady on the cover of Winter Paper Six, has a name, has oh. a name unofficially around around the headquarters here. And I think Olivia's going to be doing something on Twitter about guessing <laughs> her name. So so watch out for that. I'm not actually on the internet myself, so I wouldn't know about these things. <laughs> just, 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 <laughs> just so you know. Um, I, I, I kind of asked you all um, in advance to, to maybe pick an, someone else's piece in the book to, to, to just to mention quickly and, and to talk about. Roisin, who, who, who did you find in there? There were so many good ones. But, um, one that stood out to me was John Patrick Mackey's essay. It's called Death and the Family. Yeah. And um, oh, wow, there's so many things about it. I mean, uh, just for one, it's a beautiful piece of writing. Um, it sort of subverts what I associate uh, as a kind of common trope in Irish literature of writing about your family, which to me is sort of um, alien. I've never really wanted to write about my family, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I'm also not brave enough to, to risk the wrath. But uh, he, he does it and he does it with so much texture and so much self-interrogation. It's about two deaths uh, per the title. It's, it's about two really rather tragic sounding deaths. One is of his grandfather of dementia and the other is his cousin who's only uh, in his, I think, late teens. Mm. And um, what I really love about it is that he confronts every cliche of writing about grief throughout mm. it. He, he brings himself in in a way that feels inevitable actually, which feels like it would be a denial not to, you know, mm. to kind of be all like the selfless great writer who's like, you know, kind of canonizing an ordinary person. And it's it's not about that. It's, um, it's about examining, like there's that famous line um, that Joan Didion apparently said of like, a writer is always selling someone out, mm. um, which is the sort of unlovely truth. But I mean, to me, it, it is a truth, you know, because you're yeah. the one telling the story. What I love about his piece is it just confronts that full on. It goes through every second guessing, you know, every, uh, in every kind of um, motivation and thought that goes through him. And then it ultimately reaches something completely genuine. Um, and it, it confronts cliches. I've yeah. said that already, but yeah, it's great. He, John, John, John Patrick uh, tells us that it, it's his first attempt at an essay, which is astonishing. I think it, it's really, really kind Incredible. of, um, it's a really beautifully made piece of work. And like you were saying, like the family, your own family is, is, is surely one of the most difficult things to, yeah. to, to start writing about. And I think very often in, in like any writer's career, you kind of hover around it for years you kind of circle it and before you get brave enough to, to kind of or before you develop a thick enough skin to, to, to get in there and and, and, and and to start to investigate your own fundamental stuff that comes out of family life but, but, but also, straight in. yeah I, I, and the Didion quote about you're always selling someone out which I which I which I always kind of go back to as well and like the ideal thing is if it's yourself that 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 you're selling out and he, <laughs> he, he, he does so beautifully in this one but there, there's a particularly good um masturbation anecdote which yes! um, <laughs> the if, if, 
every, every, every good essay needs to have a masturbation anecdote in there somewhere. John Patrick has, like, has, honestly, hasn't let us down. Hasn't let us down with this one. But it's, um, yeah, it's, it's, honestly, it's, you get the sense he used this as an opportunity to actually gain perspective on yeah. himself, on the past, or maybe on other people too. And I love that because so often I see that wasted opportunity in writing. And, mm. you know, people get kind of tricked into believing it's honest because it addresses something ostensibly a difficult subject, mm. but that's not enough, you know? Yeah. I like, <laughs> I, mean, I mean, grief is, is, is such a difficult um, topic yeah. to handle in fiction. Anytime I've tried to handle grief, I kind of come at it crab wise, sidelong, just kind of edging up to it and, and just trying to trying to keep it at a remove to get to get some perspective. But he goes he goes right in to the murkiest, clammiest kind of family kind of trauma and, and just just brings it out uh, out beautifully. Um, th thanks, Roisin. That was a, that was a great one to pick. T Tim, Tim McGowan in, in, in Mexico oh, City. Uh, who, who did you pick for us? I, I went for uh, Niddy Zach's uh, Connemara Chronicle. Um, which, which I loved. Uh, yeah. I, I, this is going to sound like a really boring place to start, but I, I, I was reading it out loud, and I just loved what she was doing with the line breaks. Like, because yeah. I get halfway through the line, and I, I, I'd like have to take a breath, and and it always happened to coincide with like a break within the line. Like the control is unbelievable for me. Yeah. Um, I, and I, I, I'm a big fan of like this feeling in poetry where, uh, the like the. The sense is kind of semi overwhelmed by sound, but pulling back, you know, against mm. the sort of phonemic uh, tide or whatever. And, and she surfs it just tremendously, you know. Um, yeah. And and guess that there was this thing I heard about um, the Not I play Beckett did where uh, he was trying to get the lines to be as much oxygen as you can expel before you have to like take a big suck of air. And I was getting that, especially in the first section. Yeah. But for, for it to be that controlled and powerful and clear and uh, to have that kind of like Russian feeling under my ribs, you know, that like terror yeah. of, of uh, freedom and danger and, and, and escape and what, you know, the two ways escape can be like escaped into something, uh, escape from as well. Yeah, marvelous. Yeah. Like the, the, the yeah. level of control that she has in all of her work that I read. Uh, yeah, yeah. For, very for, exciting. For, Frightening. She's a really exciting writer. Uh, there's very apparently there's a very interesting film project to watch out for uh, from oh, Niddy great. coming up as well, which is going to be amazing, I think. Um, Kerry, 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 who do, who who did you pick for us? Who did you find? So again, like I mean, like Roisin said, it was really hard because everybody's was amazing. But I went for um, a quickening in the stillness by Susan Cahill. I just like weirdly, I always did that thing where I open it up randomly, and it was actually the first piece that I, I read um, and it's still like every time I read it again it's kind of bringing something more she's writing about um, being like coming home during the pan during lockdown to tell her mommy that she's pregnant and she just you know when when writers write about something that's in them it can kind of go one or other way they can bring you in really close or they can keep you in the outside world but she does the dance between the two and it's it's just glistening like she talks about um she talks about the world and the outside world and what's happening in the outside and her family as well which of course is a difficult topic but then she just talks about the inner landscape like and it's completely gorgeous so the opening line, um, uncertainty has, set, has settled on me like snow, quiet and intractable. Its secrets buried like seeds in the cold earth. Mm. Just floored me, like I was floored. It's beautiful, and then the yeah. Through, it's gorgeous. And yeah. this idea of darkness and um, pregnancy as loneliness and the skin of the sky. I don't know, her analogies and, uh, and, and her metaphors just... Like I'm a real sickler for really lyrical um, poetry in, mm. I think in anything, but like in particular in, the, in a per personal essay, which is like yeah. when women write an essay, it's a personal essay. But uh, yeah, <laughs> I, I just adore, I, I yeah, literally the... like, I'm obsessed with it. I think it's... Yeah. 
you, you, you broke it up slightly on the sound there, uh, Carrie, but we've, we, we've got the, we've, we've got the gist of it. Oh, uh, it, no. It, yeah, we can hear you now again. You're grand. <laughs> you're back. You're back with the yeah. sound. Yeah, sorry about that. But yeah, I just, I don't know. I loved it. Um, I guess it just, yeah. at, at, the, at the time I was thinking, just before Winter Papers arrived, I was thinking, like, when when are we going to read about these kind of important things that are being experienced so differently by yeah. people um, yeah. uh, because of because of the pandemic and the one thing for me that came to mind was experiencing that really beautiful time of of having another creature inside you and mm. and it being so different and she just <laughs> nails it like I think yeah just I and, love it and in the the, there's a lyric note that's really beautiful in the piece and, and, and the lyric note is I always think it's especially um, difficult in, in non-fiction in, 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 in a memoir piece to bring that in and she does, she does it brilliantly um, oh gosh, just, just, just finally to the three of you guys I mean uh, thanks thanks so much by the way and I, I, I'll wrap up properly in a few minutes and just, just a last question for, for, for each of you and it's, it's do you feel that the kind of year we've been through the, has, it, has it changed you in, in any way as a writer? Uh, who, who, who wants to pop in? <laughs> Good question. Roisin? Something that I use writing as is a testament to my own um, emotional volatility. <laughs> like, uh, I feel really strongly about something uh, and it could be just my feelings or it could be that I'm obsessed with some subject that I've chosen to write about. And then like a month later, I go back and I'm like, how did I get that absorbed? You know, or why did I care this much about this thing? And, um, you know, writing is, it's funny that way. It just shows you how changeable you are. And, and this, this year, especially in light of news that there might be a vaccine now, mm. it's funny just how dramatically something can change, how we're different people from one day to the next or one year to the next. And, I guess that's fascinating too in that we've all been the same person in some capacity this year we've all been a little bit obsessive we've all been watching like the twitter timeline or mm. news coming in and feeling fear or although i've talked to a lot of people who say they enjoyed lockdown and that it was a well-earned break from life yeah it, it, it's, it's weird I, I i think like in terms of any writer's prose style they're, they're like there's nothing mysterious about it it's it's a very direct projection of, of of your personality um and i think there's definitely a kind of a COVID prose style that <laughs> yeah. that, 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 that that's evident that, that that there is a kind of a definite underlying kind of anxiety um and also a kind of a kind of a you know the, the kind of a straightening of the shoulders with writers going why 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 you know asking yourself fundamental questions about why 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 we're doing this i i found it a great kind of reprieve in some ways to to go back to my desk and just to try and try and write funny stories or whatever you know it's, thank, god, <laughs> thank god i have this where where where, where i can just lose myself hopefully in a word but it, it definitely impacts what, what what about you tim yeah the I, I, both of the sort of perspectives there it definitely resonated a lot like I've, I've been monitoring myself through my writing a lot um i know it sounds a bit wishy-washy sort of using it as a bit of a therapeutic exercise like you know i'm kind of sick of caring about my bloody characters you know what about me <laughs> the man you know uh but yeah just using the methods of fiction to sort of dig into it like that that thing you said about the underlying anxiety and the covid prose writing stuff i I've been trying to pick up on that thrum of pain in my language anyway, and fucking circumstances have basically mashed my head into it. Yeah. Uh, anyway, so it's been revolutionary stylistically or whatever. Yeah, I've been reading loads of lads who I was too afraid to read. And mm. seen, I was like, you know, now is kind of the time to figure out uh, what a particular kind of sentence rhythm is meant yeah. to do. You know? so I got big into Gombrowicz again. Wow. Uh, yeah. He's, he's perfect for a time of paranoia, right. I feel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that'd he be would, the big yeah, one. He, yeah. he, he would speak to it, yeah. It, oh, it, 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 it's, it's, it's strange. I'd like I've, a very obvious thing I found when I was writing anything was that 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 the kind of the more boom boom jokes were weren't, weren't showing up at all. You know? <laughs> <laughs> the, the kind of the boom tish times seemed a bit like who who, who are you kidding? 
you know what this is? Yeah, um, yeah. If I, 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 if I make jokes, it's like it's yeah. acid fried paranoia. Like, <laughs> I know. Like, oh, <laughs> and then there, there was the whole dilemma. Here. There was the whole dilemma early on in the first lockdown where people were saying, "Well, you know, Shakespeare wrote King Lear." George, George, the plays, he was hoarding uh, grain uh, in the last day. He was a landowner. <laughs> Well, like I, I was telling myself, you don't need to write King Lear. But then after about three weeks of lockdown, I was going, maybe I, maybe exactly what I need to do is go and write King Lear. I do, do the Pierre Menard thing. Just transcribe it. And right, it comes out of the in crisis of our time. Lads hoarding yeah. grains. What, what, what about you, Kerry? Do, do you think it'll impact you in, in, in the long term? Um. Yeah, I do definitely because like you've all experienced my I don't have Wi-Fi here. So my I couldn't do anything at all like online, nothing because we didn't even have a connection during the beginning of lockdown. Um we were still on waiting to see if they could give it to us and then they couldn't. So like I didn't do this is my first Zoom call. <laughs> so it's like and we're co- we're hopefully coming out of lockdown soon so I think like I really could just write um I couldn't do anything else I couldn't um like I couldn't do any events at all so um I didn't have that kind of fatigue thing that people were saying you know they were spending the whole day on zoom and they were like they were really stressed as well um quite a lot of the time we couldn't get um like we, I couldn't get Twitter I couldn't um like I was hearing my news through the radio. So I think that early bit of lockdown before we did get some connection um, was very different from this one now, because yeah. now I can do that like anxiety ridden thing where it's yeah. like, ooh, yeah, yeah. but I've just tried to fucking keep putting pen to paper because yeah. I think yeah, it's, loads it's, of people had to keep working. Um, yeah, no, it's, it's, and, and we're lucky, you know, that we don't have to leave the house anyway. We're you know, so lucky. We're so lucky. We don't have to get dressed. Sure. You know, we dress. yeah, if we are up. so lucky. I know. Anyway. So anyway, that, that, no, that's, I'm that's, great. I feel more grateful for being able. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's 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 been it's been revealed that we're we're kind of blessed in this weird way of, of being able to always go always yeah. go back to the page. Even if uh, I did find like that the, the page count was slowing down a bit from my, my usual uh, rate of productivity. Yeah. Um, but anyway, but listen, thank thanks so much to everyone. Thanks to thanks, Roisin man. and Tim. Thank thanks, you. Perry, you've, you've always thank been you. marvelous. Thanks, great. a million. A great time. This, uh, we'll, we'll show this gorgeous, this gorgeous production again. Winter Paper 6 is available. Mm. I, I have to read out official stuff um, now that uh, Winter Papers is for sale and the link to purchase is in the chat or go to the Dublin Book Festival bookshop on the website. And there's loads more um, amazing events coming o- o- over over the course of, of, of the next while. So, so have a look. Um, so so thanks so much everyone for joining us and, and we'll do we'll, we'll do the zoom wave. We'll do that forlorn melancholy. <laughs> 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 <laughs>